All right, guys, it's April Fool's Thursday night. We're here on one of our off nights, have a very special conversation that I'm excited to get to today about one of the issues I'm most passionate about, uh, the Second Amendment, gun rights, gun violence. We're going to have a very thoughtful dialogue with a, a gentleman that I'm about to introduce shortly. Um, but how appropriate this week where we've had a couple of incidents that we've been working on with people like Avi Racklin and Freehold uh, and Aramis Rosario, where a lot of interactions with police, Avi specifically, trying to get a firearms permit and some of the obstacles that he's dealt with. And also some of the activism and stories that we hope to share in the near future when we get the clear to... Uh, discuss them publicly with our council. But uh, as always, we want to thank our great friends, Lorenzotti Coffee. If you go to lorenzotti.coffee and put in code BLUESTAR, you get 10% off your entire order. Friends of Liberty, Friends of the Movement, sponsor all of our other uh, brothers and sisters in this network. Great guys uh, importing a premium product from Naples, Italy. If you want to check them out right here at the bottom of the screen, the link will be scrolling throughout this transmission and uh, go and give them a check out. Every time you purchase something with our code from them, you're also helping us out as well. So uh, the goal of this organization is, you know, we, we have one of our mottos is iron sharpens iron, just coined by David Maxim, our, our board member and friend. And it's about having discussions with people in order to strengthen your position, right? And when I say that, I don't mean to convince other people that you're right necessarily or, or to make other people seem like they're incorrect, but to have discussions to test yourself and test what, what the tools that you have to make your arguments and seeing whether they're valid, seeing whether they withstand scrutiny from an audience of people. Uh, and, and that's always been our goal, to try to invite people from all sides of the spectrum to have these, dis these discussions. Um, lately, it's been sort of biased to the Second Amendment and gun issues, uh, and that's the dialogue we're going to have today. Our goal is to expand this to be obviously about many different issues. Um, but I'm very excited to introduce a guest who I got to meet a little bit on the phone a couple of weeks ago. Extremely polite, extremely thoughtful guy. Was very kind to donate his time to us tonight and speak a little bit about uh, gun control issues, which he's very passionate about. Obviously, we're coming at this issue from very different sides of the spectrum, but I'm very excited to have this dialogue and get some interaction from the audience and see what we can uh, get to here. So I want to introduce Dwight. He's... Uh, I'm going to let him do the introductions because he's got quite the resume and I don't want to screw any of it up. Dwight, thank you for being here. Can you please introduce yourself to our audience? Hi, Daniel. Good evening. Oh, uh, I'll spare you. I, I, you know, I sent Daniel a, a wonderful, like 100, 200 word intro, uh, and I am not going to belabor uh, that and go through that whole intro. And it's on the info. It's on the info of there all of go. these videos. There so you if you're watching, just click info and it's right there. <laughs> if you need something to help you fall asleep, it's right there. Just go for it. Um, so yeah, I've, I've been involved in gun violence prevention work uh, with Brady as well as Gays Against Guns. I started uh, protesting and trying to help out uh, right after Sandy Hook. Uh, Josh Gottheimer may not be ready to agree to this, but I believe that I am the one and my group who really got rid of Scott Garrett uh, with our, <laughs> our multiple protests, our, our sit-in that we had to be kicked out by the cops uh, back in the fall of 2018. Um, and as far as protesting goes, that went radio silent uh, in 2016 because Frankly, there was not much to protest uh, after the election day of 2016. Um, and we have a, a, a host of really wonderful uh, gun violence prevention laws here in New Jersey. So I kind of let things go a little bit more quiet. Uh, but when Daniel's invitation came through, I said, absolutely, let's talk. <laughs> That's, Let's talk about this. That's awesome. I want to dwell on that for a second, what you talked about with um, with Scott Garrett. Uh, mm -hmm. I know he's the former congressman up there in northeast New Jersey, Bergen County area, uh, North Jersey. What was that specific sit-in about? Uh, his, his positions with regard to uh, uh, refusal to support uh, full background checks. We had, oh my God, we're talking three years ago now, two and a half years ago. I, I don't have my 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 list of, of all of the things that we complained about. Uh, all I know is we caught them completely off guard. Uh, we said to them, we, we, we actually had a little tete-a-tete uh, -tete with, with one of Scott's people in his office in Glenrock. 
And we had already been prepared and we said, and we would like answers to our questions. Because we had, you know, a series of a few questions that of course he was never gonna answer. He's a <laughs> smart politician, they don't answer. And then when they said, we'll get back to you, we said, great, we'll wait. And we stunned them. And eventually they kind of made us wait in the outer hallway. And then eventually we, we just waited in front of their door. And when we showed up the second day, that's when they were like, oh, this is not a joke. These people are going to be here every day. We've got to get rid of them. And that's when they called the cops. Oh, they called the police on you. Interesting. They did. How did, you, how did that feel? Did you guys just walk away when they showed up? Uh, we, we had a polite discussion with the, the police for a few minutes. And, and frankly, we were doing this on a shoestring. We had, we had coverage for that day. Garrett didn't know that we didn't have any other coverage for, for the rest of the days until election day. So it was like, we made our point. We, we put our, our, you know, our videos out on, on YouTube and, and uh, Facebook and we were done. So that, that's, this is a good starting point. This is a good jump off point. So mm -hmm. what building were you in where that happened? Was it a public building? It was a private uh, commercial space that Garrett was renting office space in. I think there were a few medical offices in. So we did not have a right to, to be there on public on on that private office space protesting. Yeah, I was secretly hoping you were going to say it was a public space. No, so no, 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 no. <laughs> I've dealt with lots of lots of police officers about protesting through the years. I can tell you which town in Bergen County uh, actually doesn't like gun violence prevention protesting. And I can tell you which ones actively will support it. Um, but I don't want to name names. And you don't want to name names? No, 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 no. Because some days I have to go into those te that one particular town and buy things. So I don't want to name names. <laughs> <laughs> if I had to guess, it's going to be the urban ones are sympathetic and the more suburban ones are, are antagonistic. Is that a fair thing to say? Um, it's only one town in particular where I went toe to toe with a cop and, and he basically pushed back on me and uh, it, it wasn't pretty. <laughs> at, at, le at least media was watching it. That that was good. Well, let's start. Let's start with that. So a police officer kind of gets in your face, maybe gets a little aggressive, doesn't want this conversation, you know, this to happen. Um, how does that make you feel, you know, knowing that someone like him has a gun and can stop you from speaking or intimidate you into walking away or stopping what you're doing? Um, honestly, it didn't really concern me. It, it's not like I'm walking around like breathing while black. Okay. It's, it's not <laughs> like that. Right. I, I, a white dude with, with, with gray hair, uh, the cops aren't actually that worried about me. Right. So, you know, I, I wasn't afraid. Got you. All right. Let, we could talk about the racial angle. I think that's, that's also a great point. So from my, from my perspective, I see a lot of ways in which minorities, particularly blacks and Hispanics, um, they get hurt by a lot of laws that I would say are intended to be gun control laws, right? So uh, in the urban areas like Newark, my family's from Newark. When they immigrated mm -hmm. to this country, that's where we landed. Everyone in my family lived in Newark at some point. Um, several years ago, if you were to go to try to get a gun permit in Newark, they would actually tell you, and by I say permit, I mean the FPIC card, the yellow card that you need to be able to buy firearms. They would say like, you know what? You take a, you know, you take a day off work to go and, and meet the detective or the clerk who handles these applications. And let's say you show up on a Tuesday, they would respond and say, you know what? Uh, our guy is only here from four o'clock to five o'clock on Thursday afternoons. Come back Thursday. We're not talking to you. And inevitably, a lot of people that live in areas that are higher crime that that experience, you know, a worse crime rate, they some people that wanted to lawfully get guns would end up going to the black market because the police departments were so strict in these rules of how you could interact with them that they were like, you know what, screw this. I, I can't be taking days off work. I need to make money. I'm just going to go buy this off some guy in a trunk somewhere in an alley. You, you bring up an interesting point. And frankly, I, 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 I hear what you're saying. Uh, the, the rules and, and regulations and, and waiting periods are, you know, are set, but it should be in general, no more onerous to get a gun permit as long as you meet all of the proper legal criteria as it is to, to register to vote, right? Right. They, they should 
be easy things to be able to do as long as you meet certain criteria, right? But you bring up the point about the, the black market guns, and frankly, that's where 80% of our gun crime in New Jersey comes from, is these black market guns that are brought through on the iron pipeline uh, from other states, mostly Pennsylvania. Um, we ha Actually, there is a, a bill uh, that's second time it's going to die probably uh, in the Assembly and the Senate uh, that I affectionately call the Iron Pipeline Protection Act, which would ban state-funded travel to any state that did not have a suite of particular gun violence prevention measures in place the way we do here in New Jersey and frankly the way a lot of other states that have much lower gun crime rates have as well. It, it's sort of like the uh, the no hate law that, that California has that eventually got North Carolina to back down on their trans bathroom bill back in the day. Oh, uh, was this right. because of uh, filming or the basketball game or some, something like that, right? In North no, Carolina? No. Uh, well, yeah, they, they, they got they got lots of, they got the NCAA and they got filmmakers and lots of corporations to get on board. But basically, if you if you name blame and shame uh, states, you, you get their attention. Right. Gotcha. There, there's, there's no penalty being paid by the people of Pennsylvania to have all these guns come illegally into the state of New Jersey, causing 80 percent of the violence, the gun violence in the state of New Jersey. And approximately 80 percent of the victims are BIPOC, right? Black, indigenous people of color. So that that goes in that goes in two interesting directions. So why is it that? So states like Pennsylvania, I, I'll take your word for it that they're coming from Pennsylvania. I'm fully. Uh, they, you I'm, can get you can actually get the info on the internet. Pennsylvania is a big one, but then each of the southern states with with weak gun laws also contribute a percentage. Sure, I'm fully familiar with the Iron Corridor nomenclature. I, I'm I'm aware of that that mm -hmm. entire concept. What? Why do you think it is that these firearms that are illegal that come from states like Virginia or Pennsylvania? Why is it that? they don't just be uh, implicated in crimes there. Why is it that it happens here in such a large number? Because wherever there's a supply and demand issue in the world, you will find a certain group of individuals who are willing to break the laws in order to make money illegally. That's that kind of just goes without saying, I think. Right, but shouldn't we see a commensurate? So if they're loosely available in Pennsylvania, wouldn't we see a commensurate or equal amount of violence and crime there as we do here? If I can get them there, they can commit crimes with them if the gun is sort of like responsible for it. Is, it, is there not no, some equilibrium? No, no, the, the, the issue then becomes there is a benefit to the very strong uh, gun violence protection policies that New Jersey has put into place. Those do afford us the very low rates of gun violence that we have, right? Okay. And, and the failure of other states, such as Pennsylvania, to have more stringent policy in place is why they have so much more gun violence than we do. Got you. So if we were to flip this around to say an issue you're you're not sympathetic with and this is not i'm not saying i'm advocating for this could a bunch of red states go and say you know what the states that are very liberal with their abortion policy we're going to restrict anyone from being able to travel into our state mazel tov baby go for it see, <laughs> see how far it takes you because so, it ain't going to take you far so you'd be for this you'd be for like all I, this... i'm not i'm not for them doing that but if that's what they need to do if they if they actually believe that they're like draconian, you know, uh, frankly, uh, the, the way I see the pro-life people, I, I think they're pro-slavery. Pro I, I see uh, forcing a human being to be like forced to, to gestate another human being, that is voluntary enslavement for 10 months, right? That's, that's what it is. A woman goes through hell. Fair. And I, I did not intend for it. To, I don't want to have an abortion debate, to be honest. We, I'll gladly have that another I'll day. go there, Daniel. I'll no, go no, there. I meant to, I meant I was thinking of a placeholder, but, you know, substitute it with whatever you want. You have to go to right. Bible camp or you have to whatever conservative trope you can think of. Right, um, right. You could see how that might be destructive to people's freedoms. Right. So like now in how, New Jersey. How, and that, so no, no, no. It's only state funded travel. 
We're oh, I'm so, I, I didn't hear that distinction. So what, what, what does that mean? What does that define so, us? So that means if you are a politician, a, a bureaucrat, if you're, if you're a professor at Rutgers and you want to go, if the, if the, the bill became law, right, and you wanted to go to Pennsylvania to a conference, you could not use state funds. But what that does, all of a sudden, the conference holders go, oh, we can't have a, anything in Pennsylvania anymore, right? That's how North Carolina got brought around, right? Got you. What about um, if we were to look at uh, New England state like New Hampshire, Vermont, uh, some rural states like Montana? Um, I, I'm not like a statistics person, really. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I know some particular number, mm -hmm. but I, I have a, I, I suspect that a, a city, city, excuse me, a state like Vermont or New Hampshire likely has uh, a, a lower uh, per capita gun death rate than New Jersey. Am I wrong there? Is that something I, that you would? Say? I don't have the 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 numbers, and I don't doubt that the more the closer you put we human beings together the more stressed we get, right? And and there's always gonna be outliers on any normal curve who take that stress and like beat people up and kill people. So yeah, the, the, the if you've got 40 acres, yeah, you're far less likely to be too stressed. I get that. Yeah, but even per capita though, so like it, it ends up but being there, proportionate. But, there, there's, but there's, yeah, but the, 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 there's not that many people up there. Right. Right, they're not living in, in such close proximity. That's like saying if you took every other county in the state of Vermont and compared its gun violence rate with, with uh, Burlington, I think you'd say, oh my God, Burlington is this terrible place. Look at all this gun violence. Well, again, you put people close together, our stress levels go up, right? Right. Let's, uh, let's maybe talk about, you know, more, maybe morality with violence, right? Morality, uh, oh yeah, my yeah. God. Morality like a, uh, what you might do in a certain situation. So uh, so we can kind of peel backwards to why I think some people, you know, get are passionate in the Second Amendment sphere. So if you if you saw a, a, a loved one on your property getting hurt, whether they're getting beaten, physically being beaten up, raped, whatever kind of thing you want to conjure up, do you think it's moral for you as a third party to intervene and end the life of the person that is harming your loved one? So it's an, it's an excellent uh, anecdote, right? But I, I, I teach research to social workers as, uh, as a part-time uh, position for New York University. And one of the things that I teach my students is the plural of anecdote is not data. So these, this type of narrative, it does inflame us Mm -hmm. It does get us to a particular position, but it's not actually in keeping with what the numbers are, with what th things actually pan out. I'm very fortunate to live in, in suburban Bergen County. The violence rates are very, very low here, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I hear what you're saying. Of course, anyone would be horrified to see a loved one being hurt, but P.S., if I had a firearm in the house, the science on that issue is perfectly clear. I or my loved one are far more likely to be hurt with that gun by me or one of them than anybody else coming into our home and, and hurting one of us. So we, we have to depend on the science here, not on the narratives that scare us. That's the position I take. Right. And I, I didn't specify gun. I was going to build to that. So let's, as, <laughs> let's assume let's as, let's assume you're you're a strong guy and you can beat up the person. Right. For whatever reason. I think it's an important moral exercise to go through because it kind of informs me the the sort of foundation you're sitting on. Right. That, that where, where you kind of build your opinions from. Oh, um, man. All that all that suburban white privilege. <laughs> yeah. it, it, I, I tell you, it it is easier. There's no getting around it. Well, I'll tell you, I, I live in suburbia now. I didn't always. Mm -hmm. um, I've I like I, I think I mentioned to you off air before we started. I, I, my family's from Newark, and I lived in and worked in some very dangerous urban cities in my young twenties. Um, and I was 
assaulted a few times. I've been jumped a few times. I've had weapons pulled on me a few times. I don't really talk about that stuff too publicly, but it happens and it can happen to anybody. And just because I live in suburbia doesn't mean that something like that may not happen again. And also, the, this is a greater conversation. The Second Amendment people are not just uniquely talking about criminals. Obviously, there's other reasons for the Second Amendment. But before we get into that, I, I do think it's important to establish that foundation, right? Um, do we presume that we have, do I have autonomy over my body and my well-being, right? Do I own myself? Uh, would you agree with that, that I own myself? Well, first, I want to tell you that I'm sorry that you went through all of that. No, no big deal. That's, no. Well, I, I, I think it is a big deal. And, and I, I, I suspect that when we, when most of us, maybe not you, but when most of us go through that stuff, it really changes and colors our perspectives in the world. Now, to your question, do we have autonomy over our own bodies? It remain, reminds me of that famous quote about your freedoms end at the tip of your nose. <laughs> so I, I think the tip of our nose being part of our bodies, I, 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 I know I'm being pulled into a, uh, a little disputation here that, that you, I'm sure you've cleverly arranged because you're a very smart guy, but I'll have to agree that we should have autonomy over our bodies just as every person who owns a vagina should have the power to gestate a baby or not, right? So yes. All right. So yeah, and, and and it's it's funny you mentioned the the time frame. Uh, just to be clear, I had never touched a firearm in my life until those incidents started happening. Mm. I, I did not grow up with a firearm in my household. My parents never owned a firearm. Mm -hmm. um, they're just anecdotes here to share for you and the audience. But it's it's kind of true that those experiences did sort of push yes. me in this yes. direction. So it's a fair statement to make. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do. I, I know that. Look, I'm not really. I'm not trying to do. This is not like a trick or anything. I truly want to understand this. So, assuming that we have autonomy over ourselves, we have autonomy to defend ourselves. Uh, uh, so that, oh, that's oh, that's a push back. That's push back. Different. All of a sudden, you've changed the the parameter. No, go ahead. Push back. It, and as soon as you say we have the the autonomy to defend ourselves. You, all of a sudden, it sounds like you may slide into the defend your ground world, and or is that the term? Defend your ground? Is that those uh, stand, laws? Stand, stand your ground. ground. But I'm not. I'm Thank not. Ref you. I'm not referring to even property, right? I, I'm not even going that far. I, I want to just. There's an imminent threat to my life. Someone is. Someone is trying to end my life. Is it moral for me to defend myself with physical force, up to including lethal force? Is there ever a time when that is possible? Hmm. Sounds like it sounds like a well laid trap, and it sounds like that's the time to call nine one one, to have the duly deputized officers of the law protect you. Do do I advocate people carrying guns? Brrr, no. <laughs> No, F fair enough. So to, I have a I, uh, people that that know that know the stuff that we work on. Um, I actually gave a speech last week to Freehold Townships Borough Council mm -hmm. on that very issue. Um, the one thing that troubles me about that perspective is that which, which you mean my perspective of get the uh, cops. Yes, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Uh, it, I'll shorten and make this quick because some of the people that follow us will know this. Some of the other people that are new today won't. But um, the police have no legal duty to provide you individualized protection. That is codified by multiple cases in the Supreme and District Courts. I've Name heard that. It's yeah. scary. Namely in 2005, which is Castle Rock v. Gonzalez and Warren v. D.C., which is 1981, the D.C. District Court of Appeals. I won't bore the details, so you guys can Google it if you want to look at it. Um, one was a rape case. 1981 was a rape case. 2005 was a uh, breaking of a restraining order case where a child was kidnapped. And in both, uh, the opinions concluded that police have no duty to provide individualized protection. Now, that's all. I'm not a lawyer. That's all legalese. That's boring to a lot of people. Let's make this practical. This past year, you had the George Floyd incident, which I personally found abhorrent, to say the least, to say the least. Now, after that happened, you saw a slew of American cities on fire, uh, getting uh, having a lot of riots, private property destroyed. Mm -hmm. And you saw a lot of police officers, particularly in New York City, let's keep it local, who, as they saw stores getting raided, they did this and stood there and had orders to stand down. It's 
if the legalese, you know, doesn't make sense to some people, that is a personification in real life of the fact that they have no duty to help you. So what would you say to comfort someone who goes, I can call them all I want. They may not show up. They may show up late. They may show up and find out that the situation is dangerous and they don't want to come into my house. Um, the guy is already here right in front of me. Do we ever have the moral authority to defend ourselves from an imminent threat or are we obligated to always turn to the state? So I may not be able to comfort that person who has that fear. That's entirely possible, but we should not create gun policy based on the fears of, of individuals. We should base gun policy on the science around gun violence prevention, right? I, 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 I can guarantee you, I, I've done the work that I've done in my office for, well, not in this office entirely, but I've done the, the work for over 30 years. There are people I cannot reach and I cannot help. I cannot remove that fear. But that does not mean that if they arm themselves with a gun, that they're going to be able to protect themselves. Look at the numbers. They're far more likely to get themselves or a loved one killed with that gun. That's clear. Right. And I and again, let's divorce guns from this. This is just make this purely philosophical. The weapon can be my fists, right? Let's say there's just someone beating you has a knife and I, I want to defend myself with my fists. Do we have the moral authority, the moral agency to defend ourselves? It's with an, violence it's an excellent question and it's not one i've considered it sounds like one for philosophers um i i'm not gonna you know uh i again white privilege nobody's beaten me up since middle school <laughs> well we don't want anybody beating anybody up I, I i think i think a lot of people in this in this realm would argue that they embrace this stuff precisely because they don't want people to get beat up. Um, but fair enough. If you, sorry, were you going to say but something? I, I hear that, yeah. but they, they, what I, it's my strong impression that they have focused on narratives around gun violence and not on the numbers related to gun violence. And, and that's, that's a scary thing to me. And, I personally believe they're mistaken to do that. Right. I think that that people that follow the sort of legal end of this um, in focus on what I mentioned about the police. So if you look at Parkland, the Parkland shooting that happened in Florida with the, right. high, the high school, right. there was a police officer who jetted and left and he was brought up on a review, put on desk duty. And a year and a half later, they said, actually, we don't have any grounds to uh, to punish you here's back pay for the last year and a half and you're free to go back to your job and it's because he has no duty to protect people and provide individualized protection um that is i think the issue that that gets people we have an inherently disinterested third party right an inherently not culpable party in the police so they may help you they may come on time to save you and they may choose to do whatever they need to do to help you, but they don't have to. And so, that's the struggle that people right. confront. So, so Daniel, your, your point is very well made that Parkland should have never happened. And it was terrible carnage, but knock on wood, we haven't had that in the state of New Jersey. Why haven't we had that in the state of New Jersey? Because it's very, very difficult to get a gun and it's even harder for a 17 year old or a 16 year old to get a gun. I forget how old the shooter was. Right? Yeah, he was he was that age. Do and you know it, go ahead. Do you know that the authorities were tipped off multiple times about that kid? Uh I did hear that. The FBI which, actually. Which just goes to show you how terrible our law enforcement <laughs> is even when it comes to the laws on the books. But let's be perfectly clear. It's really easy to get a gun in the state of Florida compared to the state of New Jersey. So when we look at the gun violence rates in Florida and compare them to New Jersey, we go, there's something there, right? There's something there. But if you imagine you're a parent in that you're a parent of a child in that school and you think you go through this logical process and you go, all right, let's assume I believe in this worldview. 
that having the gun around me is inherently bad, having the gun in the school is inherently bad. Let's assume those positions. Mm -hmm. And it's like, just call the police. And in that instance, they notified the FBI, I, I wanna say it was three times, maybe it was two. They tipped them off multiple times that this kid was a bit of a head case and was going through some things and they ignored it, right? And again, no one was arrested at the FBI for failing to follow this tip. Nobody was consequenced for failing to investigate the child right. or the family. It, it, it almost reinforces that point. At the end of the day, the government doesn't have to help you. They could... It, yeah, see, I think it reinforces a different point, Daniel. And I think the point it reinforces is that there's a really good reason to live in the state of New Jersey. There's a really good reason to pay those god awful property taxes we all pay. And that's that we have far more sane gun policy in this state. Frankly, I would not be in that situation in Florida. There's a reason I pay the high taxes. There's a reason I live in New Jersey. Right? Actually, there's a number of reasons. I I won't even go to Alabama. I won't go to Mississippi. And it's that's just not even their gun policy. That's that's their racism and their homophobia. It's like, oh, I'm just gonna stay away from those places. So we're we're you and I are very lucky. We're very we're very lucky that we can afford to live in a suburban setting, right? I mean, you talked about privilege earlier. Well, I'm I'm certainly privileged to live where I live. Mm -hmm. What about the the minorities that live in a Newark or a Camden or a Patterson that's stricken with gun violence? That's what, that what, is why I wrote and have tried my hardest, given the fact that I have to keep a roof over my head and I'm not a politician uh, and I'm not a lobbyist to get the Iron Pipeline Protection Act passed to help protect BIPOC. And what have our legislators in the Assembly and Senate done? It has sat. What has the governor's office done it? Well, to be frank, I got some very kind words and I was told, you know, as soon as we get past this pandemic thing, the governor's going to uh, I'm going to introduce this to the governor and we're going to see what we can do about that. Well, you know, the pandemic is going on and on and on. And yet the, the you know, the stuff still goes down in Patterson. It still goes down in Newark and Camden and people get shot and killed. So if we want to protect those people in those communities, we need to sacrifice a little bit and stop state funded travel to other states just as a starting point right got you why why do you think these urban communities end up experiencing more crime or it crimes with guns why does it occur there um because of uh, centuries of racism and and white privilege and white supremacy and I'm saying that as a white dude right uh, hurt people hurt and hopeless people are hopeless right and when people feel they've got nothing to lose bad things happen so what 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 specific like I understand what you're saying what specifically though so like I live in Passaic uh, I'm a black guy they shoot people because they f I'm not I'm not condensing what you're saying to this. I'm not trying to be like sarcastic, but mm -hmm. they just go and commit crimes because someone was racist to them at one point. Like I'm not following. No, not. No, 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 no. That's 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 simplifying the narrative. They have almost no opportunity compared to the white kids in the suburbs of Bergen County because of the the, the lack of resources that they were born into, the lack of education and opportunity that their parents and their parents' parents and their parents' parents had, right? It goes back. It goes back a long way. I'm not saying that there's any easy cure for this because I don't think there is. But every time we can come up with a step to help reduce it, I think we have a duty to try to do so. Would you say that it's class based as well, or purely racial? No, or no, no, it's 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 class based as well. But the the Venn diagrams around class and and race are you know the the, the overlay is huge. So are 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 like would you say that this phenomenon exists with like southern poor whites? Are they like shooting each other? And I don't have the data. And and when, as someone who teaches research, I try to catch myself when I don't have the data. I try to shut the mouth, right? Because <laughs> I'll mess up. What uh? Let's talk about uh something I think contributes to it and that I think is bad. I, I I'm curious what you think about this. What's your stance on drugs, 
drug legalization, drug laws? Where do you stand on that realm? Uh, I'm pretty ignorant on it to be to be quite honest it's it's not not anything that i've studied um i hear very interesting tales out of portugal <laughs> and, and my suspicion is we better learn from them like i i know i i, I will i will bet a, a stack of of benjamins that if if we handled our uh, our penitentiaries the way they do in scandinavia we would see huge change in our in our violence and recidivism rates, right? And I'm kind of guessing the Portuguese are onto something with legalizing all those drugs. Were you aware that my family's from there? I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't. So were you? Did you grow up in like Ironbound? Yes, that's where oh. I that's where I lived when I was a little kid, and then they oh. moved out of there in the late '80s or so. But yeah, they did this about 20 years ago. Um, phenomenal data driven success. Uh, overdoses went down, crime went down, um, deaths went down. Uh, not just overdoses, but deaths and overdoses. I hear you. Uh, yeah, and it was namely uh, the biggest culprit was like needles, was like HIV and uh, and the gypsy population, basically. Um, so like the biggest scare was the AIDS pandemic, and that was getting spread around by heroin use. So they saw dramatic drops in all of this. Now, um, would you say that? the that that kind of policy that we have here in the united states and in new jersey that that also has a negative effect on urban communities uh, well, uh, uh, uh you are kidding me right yeah and, and we know that's the case and and we just like had a come to jesus moment uh was it la it, it was last month that that uh, murphy finally signed the law legalizing weed right and we're 15 months away still from having weed stores out there he did like he did like this if this is legalization he did like this okay. but he did he did okay. something he okay. did something yeah so we we know we've got it wrong uh and and we have taken the beginning steps towards getting it right uh but i think the portuguese are onto something I agree with you. So this is where I, I, I will try to connect this to guns. So I we we would we would agree that well I won't say that we would agree. I, I believe that we might. We, we might. I don't think we're going to, but I, I believe the government is not good at solving crises. That's that's number one. But number two, they're certainly not good at uh, policing drugs. Right. It, the only thing that policing drugs has done is. One, spent a ton of people's money. Two, killed a lot of people in urban neighborhoods, ruined yes. their lives. Yes. And three, empowered a criminal element that, you know, a black market that doesn't need to be there. Yes. Um, so given that, you know, having laws against all of these things and this criminal element doesn't work, and we agree that the model of legalization is better there, where why can't there be some crossover in that philosophy with guns? Do you think that it's different with guns for some reason that having them not be so regulated might possibly have a positive effect? No, no. The data is is crystal clear on that. The less regulated guns are in, in, a, in a society, the higher your gun violence rates. Uh, our, our gun violence rates in New Jersey are, are scary in comparison to the gun violence rates in countries that have even stiffer regulation around gun violence, around gun policy, right? I personally, I, I, I got to tell you, I, I think it, I can't remember if it was Mitch or Marco who said on the floor of the Senate uh, after, uh, I think it was after Colorado, not after Atlanta uh, the other week, that that person was mentally ill and it's a problem of mental illness. And I thought, you know what, Mitch, you're right. But what he's not understanding or accepting, or at least willing to put into words that come off the tip of his tongue, are that lots of us out there with access to guns are mentally ill. And what we really need in this country is a fitness to possess test. Okay, right? tell me more about that. Well, look, Daniel, do you think for one minute that in, 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 uh, Concord and Lexington, Massachusetts in, in 1774, I think it was. Do you think that the person 
who was hearing voices and responding to internal stimuli and, and screaming his or her head off 24 hours a day clearly was not in control of their faculties. God bless them. Do you think they'd let that person have a gun? Back you, then? Yeah, back then. Everybody in town knew this person could lose it at any second and frequently did. Do you think they'd be allowed to have a gun? Uh, if you're talking about like a private community, I don't know. What I do know is I don't think any sort of government or state entity was preventing that. And there's a big distinction between that. So they they had their militias and and every man and boy over a certain age had to go out and train and was a member of the militia, right? So they had a, and, and when that second amendment was written, there was an idea of what militia meant, right? It had a real meaning even at that time. Our militia is totally unregulated. In fact, in Heller in what was it, 2008, the Supreme Court just like said, oh, just forget that clause, it's meaningless. Well, actually it's key. It's so key. What other rights do you think we should have sort of fitness tests for where we could make a parallel? Like, should people not be able to refuse a search unless they prove they can pass a certain test, an intellectual test? Should people not be able to vote unless they show some demonstration of civic knowledge? Where could we apply that? No, to no, another no. Dan constitutional Daniel, right? Daniel, Daniel, the constitutional right around around firearms is tied in with the well-regulated militia the, so the well-regulated militia it is it also does not it does not mean what's sort of contemporary it does not mean military the militia just meant the people the people that were yeah daniel you're interpreting the constitution well what 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 did the people who framed that constitution what did they just get done doing and why did they write that uh they had just gotten done failing to run a country um, because they acted like a group of separate states and not like a, a single federal union. That's what they had just gotten done. I know you're referring to the Revolutionary War and I'm referring to the Articles of Confederation, which was what led them to have the Constitutional Convention in the first place, because acting like a, a group of spoiled, you know, I want my own way groups of, of states simply didn't work. But let, let's be perfectly clear about the Constitution. It has many blessings contained within it, and it has many curses contained within it. Most of the blessings remain. Some of the curses we have yet to root out, right? This is, this is a, a document that was created by white supremacist slave owners and their best friends. Come on. So we'll jump. I'll jump onto the slavery thing. That's a great stand up. But I want to go back to the that framing. Well regulated did not mean regulation in like today's modern context. It meant quite literally that the gun was in good condition. It was in proper working order that the people were trained with them. It did not mean that like they had this standing military. That was not the vision of the framers to have a standing military to them. The vision was that the people would be a defense against tyranny. They had just fought a war against a tyrannical government from another country at this point. And their view was that they would be in control and the saviors of themselves. So be that as it may or may not, because you're obviously depending on a historical record uh, when, when you say that, and history is always written by certain people with a certain ax to grind. We know that as well, right? Um, that document is always open to interpretation, and within our federal system, it's interpreted by the Supreme Court. Right. We also know that the Supreme Court is really, really famous for making boneheaded, terrible, like bad decisions that nobody wants to be associated with the Supreme Court justices who, you know, supported the, Dr the Dred Scott decision. It's like if that was your great, 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 great grandfather, you're like, mm, I didn't know that dude who was all about slavery and supporting it. No, no, no. So. The Supreme Court doesn't often know what it's doing. Why, why weren't the slaves permitted to have firearms? <laughs> oh, come on, Daniel. We know what would have happened. 
Did, didn't you see uh, uh, what was the the uh, I'm forgetting the uh, the movie about Harriet? It was called Harriet. I didn't oh. see this. No. Oh, oh, you've got to see Harriet. Oh, it's really, really good. It's a good movie. Um, it, but it also covers what happens when when you give uh, uh, hundreds or thousands of former slaves firearms. They're really good in the field at beating the, the Confederates. <laughs> right. Isn't that a good thing? Uh, well, wouldn't what? that have liberated them? So although we came close to a civil war just three months ago, luckily we're not in a civil war and hopefully we <laughs> never will return to a civil war. Well, right, right after, you know, during the reconstruction period, you know, mm -hmm. we finished the bloodiest war in American history. And um, one of the first things they did in the South was to basically birth gun control laws, right? It started immediately after the Civil War, and particularly with the intention of making sure that newly freed black Southerners could not get armed. And mm, you that could sounds trace like a good white supremacist move, doesn't it? Uh, it's it absolutely does. I, I personally find it abhorrent. And there's lots of instances that you can pull up even to like the 20th century where laws have been, where the force of the state and laws have been used particularly to target black people. But let's get very specific, just specifically black people. So the, the sort of history of the gun control movement in America is rooted in the black experience. It's directly targeted at them. Um, is that an issue? And I, it, obviously I know you think that's an issue. I don't mean to be condescending, but you, you said it yourself. If the slaves had guns, they would have shot at people for trying to harm them or own their body, right? To, to control them, to control them as a people. One would hope. Right. So is this a, is it not a good thing that, or rather, is it not a bad thing that these laws were used as a cudgel against this community? So let's just check in on that. So we, we, that community, which obviously is, is very diverse, even, even unto itself, made a very clear statement on what was it november 3rd of, of 2020 about the kind of country they wanted to live in and it was not to be a country with weaker gun laws they supported a president and vice presidential candidate who were very clear about wanting stronger gun gun policy Right, but right. those presidential elections are fickle, right? The winds blow. We have Trump. We have Biden. That's like very. No, offensive. we had. Oh, come on, Daniel. We had Trump because because of the curses of, of the Constitution. If, and, if if the human being who got the most votes won, we would not have had Donald Trump. Well, that's a republic uh, uh, elect electoral college conversation. But I'm saying that that's sort of an ephemeral thing, right? Like, oh, right now the winds are blowing this way. But let's it, I'm not questioning at all, like whether it's a legitimate uh, election or not. I'm just saying I want to talk more about the philosophy of these things. Right. So mm -hmm. is it not bad when the state uses its power to pass laws to specifically target people to keep them from being armed, and why would they not want them to be armed? Oh, Is it's it okay. So obviously, it's clear that in the Reconstruction South, it, I, I, I have no his understanding of this history. I'm totally accepting what you're telling me as gospel truth. That what those what those Southern legislatures did to prevent uh, BIPOC from from getting a hold of firearms was totally wrong. That's not the world we live in today. Oh, it still very much is. I mean, no, we'll, we'll, no, now we disagree. Okay. No, yeah, we'll bring this up. We'll, we'll, we'll go. I mean, I know several instances off the top of my head. I know with the influx of Southern European, which at that time was a pejorative term referring to Italians. Yeah, uh, we've don't, now rounded them up to white. Yeah, right. We're now they're now. Yeah, they're <laughs> rounded up to white. That's hilarious. It's true. Uh, I don't remember if it was called the Samson Act, the Simpson Act. It was in New York. They basically banned like handguns, like snub revolvers because of the evil gangster Italians and the prohibition era and all that. They didn't want mm -hmm. them carrying guns. You can go up to Republicans. Uh, you can go up to the governor of California, Ronald Reagan, with the Mulford Act. Um, he, you had uh, Malcolm X's wife after he passed away. They were doing demonstrations in Sacramento. And Ronald Reagan got together with his legislature and said, we can't have these Black Panthers walking around you know, Sacramento and walking around San Francisco openly carrying rifles, which they were. That was their sign of solidarity, their protest. They viewed them, their community as being threatened. So they would get together and carry rifles as a sign of like, you're not going to mess with us, right? We're going to protect our community. 
community. Um, you can see this mirrored in many other instances with the Koreans on the rooftops during the LA riots in 1990s. But, but going back to this California uh, incident, you had the legislature, a bicameral legislature of Democrats and Republicans get together and agree on this act, which banned the open carry of rifles. And it was specifically to stop the Black Panthers from marching. So oh, oh, it may have been, but it had the side benefit of keeping people from continuing to open carry rifles. Right. But those well, people, but those yeah. those people in Oakland and in those urban areas around San Francisco are the ones facing these dangers. So do, do they not have a, an, a do they not have a right to protect themselves? Um, I don't know enough about the history and what was going on in Oakland to know if if BIPOC were being harassed, menaced by by uh, white people or if the Panthers were carrying those guns as a way to show some sort of political power. I don't know. No, Malcolm X's wife, they were, oh, this isn't like conjecture. They said like, you, we need to band together. We need to open care. They were talking about this openly and the FBI chases down these people too. Uh, if M Martin Luther King, he was a target of the federal government. He had a target on his back his entire life. And there's a lot of conspiracy about how he met his demise, which I won't even get into. But he himself in Alabama, where he lived, um, he had his house firebombed, had crosses burned on his lawn. He faced a lot of ra you know, racist acts and a lot of terrible threats to his family. And he went to his sheriff and requested a carry permit through the proper channels. And my argument is because we have these laws that give this government this arbitrary power, they prevent people like Martin Luther King, people like the Black Panthers, people like newly freed slaves. And this is just to be specific with, you know, the black community from being able to protect themselves legally. It's a way of the government saying we're going to exercise legal racism because it's the law. And Mar Martin Luther King was denied a carry permit by his sheriff because he didn't have a need to have one. And we all know how he met his demise. Well, I'm not, I, I guess if you're talking about denying carry permits, um, I, I, I am actually a big fan of the New Jersey carry permit uh, situation. I know that, I don't, I don't know what all the exemptions are, but basically what I've heard over and over again, if you're not a police officer or a former police officer, you're not gonna get a carry permit in the state of New Jersey it's going to be really, really tough to impossible. It is. And I, I've actually, I'm, a, I'm an applicant of that permit. Uh, they, they only honor about 1,800 people's permit per year in a state of 9 million people. And that includes retired police officers. But is that fair in the sense that someone who's rich, you know, a Donald Trump or a, an actor that lives in Alpine or Demarest up in North Jersey, there are a lot of lawyers, uh, celebrities in that 1800 that can pay the canoodling that they have to do through the courts to get that permit to protect themselves. And that's why I want to connect that back to so you know, MLK I, I, and all of them. I'm actually guessing that the, that the, the folks with the the uh, the mansions in Alpine, um, they probably aren't worried about carrying a gun themselves. They probably have former police officers with carry permits who travel with them as bodyguards. And I, that's okay by me. And I, I'm just, when you were mentioning uh, civil rights leaders who had been assassinated, I thought, well, that reminds me of, of the Reverend William Barber and down in North Carolina. And I don't, I, I've heard the man speak, he's amazing. And I don't think for a second he would carry a firearm do I hope he has security? I sure hope he does. I hope they're well trained, and I kind of hope they're armed. So, but that that goes back to the class issue. So, you deserve protection if you can afford to pay for a security guy to follow you around. Well, that's sad, and and that may be the the way of the world. But it's not that Reverend Barber is rich; is that it's that he draws the ire uh, of a certain group of people who hate his policies right so we so but but i'm not speaking specifically to that reverend but that is an issue though we're basically saying as a society as a state well you deserve protection from a firearm so long as you're rich and you can afford to pay for it so you you get to have one in your in your castle 
in the state of New Jersey, you have to go through, you know, the, the loopholes and thread the needles to do it. But New Jersey is very clear. You don't get to carry it. Even transporting it to a range, there's 10 million rules. Right, right? but is that, is that fair, you think? Like before you were saying, yes, these people get security so, so guards. So here's, here's the thing to keep in mind. Because we don't live in Montana with, you know, it's, it's 10 miles to my neighbor's house. And maybe you do need a gun with, with grizzly bears. Maybe you do. We don't live there. And part of living in this culture, in this society, is there are things we must submit to that are not fair. It's, it comes down to the rule of TFB. Too effing bad? Is that what that is? There you go. <laughs> there you go. I think I think it's a little troubling when we kind of say, oh, if I, I that's the class part is where it gets me. Or I, I, I feel like. No, no, every... no, no. It's not. It's not class. You if 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 having that gun on your person is absolutely, you know, requirement of your existence. There are plenty of states you can move to that will allow you to do that. Right. So it's as if to say the people who live in those states have the autonomy to defend their life and their life is worth something. But someone here has to rely on an outsourced agent. No, no, Daniel, your argument does not does not comport with the numbers. Right. The people in those other states who feel and I know they feel and I don't know, but I, I believe with every fiber of my being that they feel in their hearts they're protecting themselves and their loved ones. The data don't don't play that out. It's the opposite. They're putting themselves and their loved ones in great jeopardy by having that gun. So uh, you mentioned police officers earlier. We talked about the case law regarding that. Why? Why is it? Let's again, I want to talk about the philosophy, not so much numbers and such, but why is it moral to call a police officer who then can engage in an act of violence to protect people or I, I don't know if it's moral per se. I, I, I'm a terrible one to, to weigh in on morality. I got to tell you, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm terrible at that. Um, I, what I do ha have a clear understanding of is that everything I, I know and see, and I got a lot of gray hair, <laughs> tells me that that process works. And having my own gun and drawing it on somebody that's far more likely to get me killed. That's that I know. So why, why would, why do you personally uh, feel more secure and comfortable in trusting a police officer to respond to an incident at your home? Um, Forget the fact that you think you're in more danger for having the gun. It's 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 the the logic I want to follow is you are saying you feel more secure in yourself calling on that agent to oh, come help. I, 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 I'll tell you something. If I had to call, I, I I I don't doubt for a second I would have a passing thought of Jesus. If I only had a you know an M16, an AK47, whatever the hell. Uh, I would be so much better off right now because that would make me less afraid in that second. I get that. But giving into those fears makes us far more likely to get killed. So but why why is that officer uh, better able to protect you? Like what about him that we outsource this duty? Why is he better able to protect you? Or her or, or they her. if they're trans. Let's sure. Just... <laughs> <laughs> anyone, anyone, anyone. Um, I, I'm sure you're you're leading me into something here because we both know that they are. I, I I spend you know 50 hours a week talking to people and teaching social work students about research, right? I would not have the bandwidth to become nearly as proficient in dealing with a firearm and dealing with de-escalation as a police officer who is doing that, you know, as their full-time gig, 50 weeks, 52 weeks a year. Right. Uh, so it's like a training type of thing. Like, oh, you are slick. You are so smart. But I want to build the foundation. I want to see where we can so, go. But we're not, 
in the state of New Jersey, you have the right to to thread the needle and have that gun in your castle. But you, you can't take that. it out of your castle. That's that's the issue. That's right. right. That's right. And our our gun violence rates are far lower than most other states in this country. And there are reasons for that. We have to accept those reasons. Why is it if the gun, let's look reverse engineer this now. So I understand you have a data driven concern about what can happen with a gun in your home. Why is it acceptable to you to have it in your home then legally, but not in the streets? If it's a danger to you in the streets, why not ban it at home as well? And conversely, why is my life not worth protecting on the street, but it is in my home? Um, so that's a, there's a, I'm sure there's a good legal argument around that. And I, I would not be the one to, to be able to give you a, a good definition around it. Uh, I don't, I don't want like a legal, I'm talking like, again, philosophically, like how you, you and I just speaking, how we would d justify this morally or philosophically. Um, it's data. It, I, 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 I just go back to the data. When, when, when people don't carry guns around, there's less gun violence. That's why we don't let people carry guns onto airplanes. That's why we, you know, we have metal detectors left, right, and center now. So is there less gun violence if we don't have guns in the home as well? Like, I, I would almost say uh, this. You, you know what? If you, if you look at cultures without guns in the, in the home in general, I, this is just my suspicion, but I think you're going to find even lower rates of gun violence. Would you, uh, so going back to the police angle, what I was going to eventually get to as well is there's lots of people that go through the training that police officers go through. So for example, I've passed the exact training that a police officer goes through their shooting practical to become a police officer. And I know tons of civilians in New Jersey. Well, they're all civilians. I shouldn't say that word. Tons of people in New Jersey that have passed that test. Um, however, let's assume I get the the ability, the right to carry. If I then do something in public with that firearm, I have no immunity and I don't have a bunch of case law that prevents me from having criminal or civil liability, but police officers do. So that's why I again come back to this where I struggle with reconciling how we outsource this, how we outsource this security to an inherently disinterested party that has no legal liability over you. Why, why can't we just do that ourselves and not rely on that party that has no duty to help you, um, whether it's in or outside your home? So I, I hear what you, you're saying about the, the duty arguments, and I, I, I'm kind of guessing that, it, uh, you know, maybe you have some police officers who are, are out there in the audience tonight. Maybe they could weigh in with some, some questions, but I'm kind of thinking that they would take great offense to the the concept that of only routing their rooting their duty in in that legal argument i don't think that's where they see their duty right i i think they they took an oath and and they work hard, very hard to uphold that oath and they put themselves at a lot of risk sometimes yeah, if they want to, but they don't have to. In the case in point, all those riots all summer where you watch them look at burning buildings and stand by, like the, like the Parkland shooting, like any other incident, you can call the police at any time. And if they feel it's unsafe to go in your house to respond to a call, you can't win a civil case against them after for failing to protect you. And our district courts and our Supreme Court have upheld that. Yeah, that's probably true. I don't, I don't doubt it for a second. It is not perfect. It is far from perfect, but it is far better than arming ourselves, carrying guns. That, those things we know from the data lead to far more misery. Let's go we'll go a little bit macro. I also threw out a note to the chat. Uh, there's about 25 or so people listening right now. If you guys have any particular questions that you want to pose to myself or to Dwight, um, put it here in the chat and I'll try to throw it up there. Um, I'll go for one macro point to discuss here and then we'll go to some questions and we'll wrap up. Um, if we look at the history of the last 100, 200 years, pretty much every genocidal dictator has began his 
tyranny with disarming the populace, right? This is like a typical trope of the right wing they use as an argument, um, and I, I, I agree with it. If you go to Nazi Germany, you go to Stalin, you go to Mao, you go to Hugo Chavez 10 years ago, you go to Fidel Castro when they overtook Batista. Every single one of these people uh, dehumanize certain elements in their community, and there's that parallel to the slaves I was talking about before in the United States, the black experience, whether it's the Jews in, uh, in Germany, or political dissidents in South America, they dehumanize people and then take their guns away. In fact, I, I think it was Mao that said something like, political power comes out of the barrel of a gun, right? He understood that if these people are armed, they'll be able to stop my will, right? And we see that playing out today, and I always like to connect to the current uh, time to kind of make things more relatable. You see these concentration camps in Western China with Uyghur Muslims getting killed and getting rounded up, and they you do see not. see Myanmar every day. Exactly, and there is the strictest gun laws in, in China. Um, do you have any sympathy for this viewpoint or that argument that historically people who are oppressed and genocide and get killed, demo-sided really by their governments, historically get disarmed before that happens? So that always happens when the government falls into the hands of an autocrat, a dictator, someone who abuses or throws out the rule of law. We nearly just had one of those, right? Yeah, but they, they, are you talking about the Capitol building? I, yeah, of course. Well, did you see the, I don't want to get too far off topic, but you saw that the Capitol Police allowed them all to walk in and open the gates, right? You, you know what? Clearly, from those videos, if those videos are showing us the truth of the matter, and my suspicion is that there's a good chance that they are, a certain number of Capitol Police officers probably should not have their jobs and probably were on the side of the insurrectionists. But they have then, that pesky immunity. <laughs> and then there and then there were those other police officers who got the hell beaten out of them, were killed, and defended the lives of of representatives right at the doors of, of the house. So so I'll uh, I'll throw some questions out here that I see coming from the crowd. Um, Keith here is asking if you can cite the study that shows you're more likely to hurt yourself than an intruder. Oh no, Keith, I never I never worry about citations. I I know that if I spend five minutes, I could probably pull up ten, but the citations are out there. They're, They're out, out there. Let me see if there's and if you have anything you want to challenge. I feel like I've been berating you this whole time. If there's anything you want to challenge me on or ask me about, I'm happy to answer. In the meantime, I'm going to look for some questions and then we can wrap up here. Uh, you know, you've if, done a fabulous job and you've covered a lot of ground. <laughs> Someone's here being slightly sarcastic, but uh, Scott Hitchner saying, why would the state deny the right of a black trans woman to protect themselves from a white supremacist Trump supporter? I don't know if you want to respond to that. Well, it, 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 it comes down to the issue of an anecdote. Anecdotes allow us to tell the stories that we wish were true versus the, the larger picture of what is true. So you can always find an anecdote to, to put your point across, right? And yes, the violence against black trans women is utterly terrible, but that doesn't change the underlying issue of, of what we need to do about gun policy. And if a black trans woman was in a public alley in New York getting beat up, would she be morally justified in pulling a legal concealed carry pistol and shooting her assailant? Hmm. Maybe in the toe. Maybe in the toe. So, you know, police training, that's a trope. Uh, do you, any defense training tells you you never shoot. You, you shoot for center mass. You shoot for the square where the chest is because you want to stop the assailant as quickly as possible. Um, so, again, up to and including lethal force, you would never say you endorse someone's autonomy to defend themselves against someone else oh, who is hurting right. them. I'm not getting into that. No. Well, why not? That's like the moral, the whole yeah, moral but discussion it's, it's here. It's one thing to say, I'm going to try to stop somebody from hitting me by, by pushing them away, by leaving the scene, 
by trying to get bystanders, upstanders, not bystanders, by trying to get law enforcement. That's, that's one thing. It's another thing to say, I'm going to be armed and I'm going to defend myself. Those, those, those are different universes. And the sl same thing with the slaves. We would not endorse. It. Would it be moral for a slave who was actually enslaved in the South prior to the Civil War to shoot his master because he's literally controlling his body and his self? So I personally think that would be moral, but it would actually be a very poor choice uh, on, on the part of the slave because my suspicion given given the south and given the, the history of, of lynching and and what they did to black people that that we know of after slavery ended they would probably just wipe out everybody in that person's family if not every slave on the plantation just because just to teach them a lesson well what if all the other slaves were armed too then they wouldn't be able to do that well yes but that's a that's a a fantasy and it and it, it sort of sounds like oh what's that that uh produced that director's name quentin tarantino i love quentin what, tarantino what was that 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 uh, uh, uh you're talking about um uh it's gonna come to me uh, <laughs> hold on hold on django django Unchained. yes yeah, yes yeah. Django that movie's Unchained. awesome that's a great movie well, that like it's, 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 it's like real. Why, why not? There's in, there's 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 a uh, minority populations that hold themselves off against large majority populations in history. History's replete with that. Uh, so, but, From the Battle of Thermopylae to the hills of Afghanistan to the yeah, jungles but, of Vietnam, that's happened many times. Right, but I'm not aware of any stories uh, of the of slave era Southern states where anything nearly like that occurred. Are you? Uh, I can't pull one off the top of my head. I do know that there were uh, bands that learned fighting, that learned like techniques for fighting and stuff, and went off into the woods to kind of defend oh. themselves in little communities. Good I can't think. I can't think of anything specifically. But I mean, let's look at like American foreign policy, right? Uh, Afghanistan. Those those are those are people in the mountains in a large country that have Soviet era. Kalishnikovs, right? Outdated 50 year old wow. weapons. And we've been engaged in a war with this country for 20 years and we're not winning this war, right? They're, 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 a mind, they're, they're way less sophisticated than we are. They're less numerous. They have less money. They have worse weapons. It, everything is stacked against them from a, for a sort of statistical perspective. And yet they persist and they survive. Well, it, they have the Pakistanis to help them. And they're more powerful than us? No they way. Well, the, the problem is, and, and this is like a foreign policy issue that I, I know little about, but as far as I know, the Pakistani government has not really paid a price for how they've supported the Taliban over the years. Right. And again, I'm not I'm not taking a position on this. I'm more speaking to the philosophy of it is possible for a smaller, less less powerful, less armed, less wealthy. You can have all of these negative uh, statistics on your side, but as if you're armed to some degree and you play the game the right way, you can defend yourself from a larger force. And like, that's, that's what I'm referring to. There's lots of incidences in history where that's happened. I mean, like, look at th these Uyghur Muslims, like they're getting killed because they're not allowed to defend themselves. They can't be armed as a community, as a population, they're getting brought into camps right now. Well, because they're living in a totalitarian country and, and they're a racial minority, a racial and religious minority. Yeah, it's yeah, terrible. Like it's like terrible. like slaves were in the United States. I mean, that happens here. I mean, I'm not saying well, it's that the, happened here. Right? Yeah, I'm, I'm saying that people people get abused legally here as well. I'm not saying it's necessarily equivalent. In some ways, it's worse. But we did have a we had a structure in the american south where they said you know what we can't have these blacks being armed we're just going to pass laws that says they can't have a gun for these very reasons another problem with our our u.s system of government far too much power given to the states states have done a lot of bad things with that power over the years got you all right dwight anything else you have for me uh, nope, just uh, an invitation to people. If you really want to see 
good gun policy and you recognize that it's virtually impossible given the way our federal system exists as it is today, go to hackthesenate.org and learn a new way. That's it. Dwight, I really appreciate you coming on and chatting with us. I, 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 Like I said, it's hard to get people to come and have this dialogue. You're welcome back anytime to talk about this or any other issue. If you have something you think we should be addressing, I'd be glad to have you or anyone else back on. And, and it was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, Daniel. I really enjoyed it. And I hope to talk to you again soon. Take good care. Awesome. Good night.